Early in the American Civil War, the Confederacy knew that in order to be successful, they would have to cripple the North financially. Uh, with the help of the British private citizens, they purchased a series of technologically advanced ships to be used as commerce raiders and bring the war to the North on the high seas. Uh, this successful campaign resulted in not only long-term damage to the Northern shipping industry, but also advancement in public international law. And that's what we're going to work to unpack here with Mr. Dennis Carlson as he explores the Confederate surface raider CSS Shenandoah. Hello and welcome to a special program, a partnership between the Hagen History Center, the Erie Civil War Roundtable, and the Jefferson Educational Society. I'm Ben Spagan. I'm the Vice President at the JES and I'm a contributing editor at the Erie Reader. Now, before we get a fuller introduction of our presenter and his presentation, a few programmatic reminders. Uh, folks, since this program is first airing live on both the Hagen History Center uh, event page as well as the JES Facebook page, we're going to work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as we host this event. If you have a question, just leave it in the comment section below. And of course, if you're listening to or watching a later broadcast of this program, still send us your questions, your comments to keep this conversation going. And for more information about upcoming JES programs and publications, please visit jeserie.org. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for more information on the Hagen History Center, please visit eriehistory.org and find them on the social platforms too. Now, I'd like to introduce the guest who is no stranger to the JS uh, stage and digital programming, who will introduce uh, this program's presenter. Now, you may know him from presentations on the Civil War in Erie history, or on the Cuban Missile Crisis, or on corrupt and contentious presidential elections, and or you may know him as the executive director of the Hagen History Center. Uh, Mr. George Deitch has co-founded several historical organizations related to the Civil War and the War of 1812 in Erie. He also helped create the flagship Niagara League, which played a central role in reconstructing the U.S. Brig Niagara and creating the Erie Maritime Museum. He's a prolific presenter and has been published in numerous journals and served as a consultant to National Geographic Magazine for its Civil War sesquicentennial issue. Uh, it's my pleasure to hand things over here to Mr. George Deitch uh, in this program in partnership between the Hagen History Center, the Civil War Roundtable, and the JES, as he'll introduce uh, Mr. Carlson, uh, who will present tonight. George, over to you, sir. Thank you, Ben, and it's a pleasure to, to be back. Uh, Dennis is a uh, uh, old friend. He has uh, been um, coming to the Civil War Roundtable for many years, and um, he's a longtime lover of history. Uh, as I mentioned, he's a member of the Roundtable. He's also a docent guide for the U.S. Brig Niagara, where he often shares his love of history with a wide variety of audiences. He retired in 2006 following a 40-plus uh, uh, career in business, manufacturing, and engineering that included time with uh, True Temper, AMSCO, AMSCO Medical Products, and Blyly Technologies. Today, in addition to serving as a guide and guest speaker, Dennis serves as the treasurer of the Masonic Temple Preservation Foundation, and he's past president of the Erie chapter of the JCs. Um, by the way, Dennis, congratulations on uh, getting the Masonic Temple as uh, on the National Register. I think it was very well deserved. You guys did a great job doing that. Um, Dennis graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration, Industrial Management from Penn State in 1969, and continued his education uh, with Penn State in the 90s as an alumni participant in the University Civil War Studies Program. When he's not volunteering in the community, he can be found reading, watching Penn State football, spending time with his family at home or at the Yacht Club, and hunting for wildlife with his camera. So a little bit about tonight's uh, presentation. Um, uh, I think Ben had started out by talking about the Confederacy needing to bring the war um, uh, economically to the North. And the best way to do that was to try to uh, cripple their commerce. And uh, so the successful campaign um, did true long-term damage. And, and Ben will talk about it as well as uh, uh, disrupting the uh, the trade across uh, the Atlantic and uh, so on, but also um, the results uh, were very interesting in their impact on international law. Um, in this um, event, in the partnership between the Hagen History Center, the Civil War Roundtable, and the JES, uh, we do welcome um, uh, Dennis to uh, give us his slide deck and um, 
uh, tell us all about this fascinating uh, story. So Dennis Carlson, take it away. Thank you very much, George. I really appreciate uh, working with you and Ben, and uh, I hope you enjoy this program tonight. Uh, we're gonna start off with the Confederate surface raider CSS Shenandoah. It is one of four surface raiders that came out of uh, England. Okay. There we go. Uh, the most popular one is the CSS Alabama, launched in 1862. Uh, Raphael Sims is, of course, the captain of the uh, Alabama. She was sunk uh, by the uh, Kearsarge in uh, 1864 uh, in a battle off of Cherbourg, France. The CSS Florida was commissioned in 18, August of 1862, and she was captured by a subterfuge. Uh, in Brazil in October of 1864. Uh, that's basically a polite way of saying she was cut out or we stole her fair and square. Uh, she was uh, sunk in November of 1864 in a collision uh, with the Union uh, vessel. We also have the CSS Finnegal, uh, also known as the Atlanta. It was purchased and commanded by James Bullock, who was uh, on board the Shenandoah during the expedition that we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, it lost uh, a battle with uh, the ironclad Weehawken in June of 1863. That was after she became an ironclad. And of course that brings us to the Shenandoah who was previously known as the Sea King. It was commissioned in November of 1864. James T. Waddell was commanding and eventually sold to the Sultan of Zanzibar. Uh, sunk in 1869 when it was grounded on a reef. Here we have some uh, photographs of the Alabama, Florida, uh, the Ram Atlanta, and uh, the painting of a picture of the Shenandoah uh, in activities uh, in the whaling fleet in the Northern Pacific near the Aleutian Islands. Commander James T. Waddell, uh, he was uh, a very handsome looking individual, but I don't think I'd like to meet up with him in a dark sea some night. Uh, he was uh, actually in Hong Kong when the war broke out and uh, he came back, found his way back to the United States as soon as he possibly could. And he met with the Secretary of Navy and he wanted his back pay and they said, well, we'll give it to you. Uh, providing you don't uh, take arms against us. Well, that was not his intention, and it also uh, disturbed him greatly, uh, and it didn't stop him from uh, uh, taking over the Shenandoah. Now, these vessels were vessels that came out of England. Now, British neutrality uh, was... Uh, recognizing that the Confederacy was a belligerent in 1861. Queen Victoria uh, was in mourning. She had just lost uh, her beloved husband, Prince Albert. And uh, so we have a, uh, a Lord, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Lord Pemberton. Uh, who is the prime minister, and he was uh, promulgating the activities uh, as to how we are going to be handling British neutrality with the United States. They do not really want to have a war uh, with US, even though there is uh, some uh, appreciation for the South, uh, which was also their supplier of cotton. So two weeks after the blockage began or blockade began, the prime minister proclaimed her Majesty's subjects were not to enlist in the armed forces of either party. Breaking the blockade or allowing ships to transport soldiers, military supplies, or dispatches for either side was prohibited. And further, uh, enjoining from building, arming, or outfitting any vessels that might be used as a ship of war. Now that's very good policy. Uh, and uh, it's morally 
correct perhaps, but uh, money has a uh, way of getting in the way of moral values. And there are certain people that uh, are going to say, we can probably make a few pounds, shillings or whatever uh, during this time period and uh, help out some of our friends in the South. Now, in order to discourage that, the North sent a fellow by the name of Thomas Haynes Hud Dudley as a Council of the United States of America to Great Britain. He's stationed in Liverpool. Of course, Liverpool is uh, a great ship shipbuilding port in England at this time. And uh, he felt that that's where the action is. We were trying to keep him honest. He thought to be uh, the chief spy during the um, war, but uh, I consider that perhaps a little bit uh, harsh language, but let's say he was in charge of uh, intelligence gathering uh, in this area. He was rather successful um, in doing so, uh, but nonetheless, uh, people do find ways around that. Uh, they falsify records uh, and a uh, number of other things, as well as uh, uh, moving vessels off uh, British soil or British uh, controlled seas, and then selling them to the Confederates, uh, which is what's going to happen with the Shenandoah. The map you see in front of you gives a brief outline, and it's very brief, of the travel of uh, the CSS Shenandoah um, during uh, this time period. Uh, it's a rough map and it gives you an idea of, of again, the time frame and its activities. It's actually going to change its name uh, in an island of. Um, Madeira off the African coast after it is being sold to the Confederates. Um, so uh, by changing the name and getting her arms from another vessel, uh, she's going to continue on her raid. In the Atlantic and Indian Ocean engagements, uh, seven vessels were destroyed, including one whaler. Three vessels were freed, however, the Adelaide, owned by Mr. Pendergrast, was freed, even though it was on the, in the Union flag and sailed, uh, sailed out of Baltimore, Maryland. This is an interesting uh, little conundrum because even though it's a uh, Yankee vessel, um, Mr. Pendergrast has been known to be a big Southern sympathizer. And uh, so they let that particular vessel go. The Mogul sailed out of London uh, uh, was freed because it was uh, British and uh, sailed out of a neutral country. Kate Prince sailed out of New Jersey, but was carrying coal from a neutral country. And so they let that free. Of course, these engagements are uh, called uh, privateering. Privateering is not pirating because you do have a country that is sponsoring you. And uh, the name of the game is actually you're going to disrupt uh, the commerce, and you're going to be keeping careful records, so your government is going to reimburse you with some real nice prize money uh, after you carry out your mission. Now, during this time in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, she has taken prisoners and has offloaded them in an island off of Brazil, uh, but uh, she's heading off to the whaling country and finds that uh, there's a strange noise coming from um, the stern. And they found that uh, the uh, propeller was cracked and they had no way of fixing this. Uh, she sails at about 14 knots max uh, under sail, nine knots uh, under power. And she was powered by a coal fired uh, 220 pound horsepower steam engine. In order to um, avoid 
the Iroquois and other Union vessels that were chasing her, uh, she decided to sail around uh, the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, that would be the nearest port for her to put in uh, to fix her propeller. But uh, he knew that uh, the um, Iroquois was going to be tailing her. And uh, that seemed natural to him, too. So they're going to bypass that and go into the Indian Ocean and then sail on to Melbourne. Now, when the Shenandoah was still the um, Sea King, in the summer of 1864, Grant had sent um, uh, Sheridan into the Shenandoah Valley to burn and pillage everything that he possibly could find. Uh, there were thousands of barns full of hay, provisions um, uh, burned, destroyed, or used. Um, heads of cattle and sheep were destroyed, feeling uh, the uh, blue bellies uh, in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, and uh, it was a uh, it was a really a war on the civilian population. Now. We all know that the civilian population was filled with partisans in the Shenandoah Valley and that it was the reason for this action. However, this did not set very well with the, um, with the uh, Southern friends. So um, that is why they uh, renamed the Sea King the Shenandoah. And they decided, well, if they're going to uh, conduct um, these financial raids on the South, uh, we're going to hit them where it hurts. We're going to uh, hit their whaling industry. And so they're going to get uh, the order to destroy the whaling fleet. Why are we going to do that? The peak in whaling actually hit in 1857 with 238 ships. 103,000 uh, uh, barrels of sperm oil whale, which was highly uh, prized. 260,000 barrels of whale oil, primarily from the right whale. And it was named the right whale because that's the right whale to get the oil from. 5.5 uh, million pounds of whalebone. Whalebone was actually the baleen from the right whale. And it was uh, used in uh, women's corsets, skirt hoops, um, hairbrushes, uh, buggy whips, uh, caning for chairs. Uh, and it was a very fashionable uh, in the Victorian age to have a very tight waist. So uh, whalebone was uh, quite precious. By 1860, the fleet was actually cut in half. Uh, and that's mainly due to overfishing. Now in this slide, we also see uh, a sperm whale uh, or something that resembles Moby Dick. You see the bowhead whale, uh, which is a new development uh, found in the Bering Sea, and of course, the right whale, which um, is uh, a prime mover here. Whale economics, 1854 to 1864, sperm whale oil, spermaceti, went from $124 a barrel to $178 a barrel. You know what happens to gasoline when we raise it up 20 bucks? Uh, whale oil doubled for more than to more than $128 per barrel. Whalebone increased 500%. Uh, so this was pretty lucrative uh, commerce that is all going to the North and primarily uh, to New England, which is more, where most of the whalers uh, were coming from. In 1862, we have a development and the Canadian geologist Abraham Gesner devised a method to extract kerosene from petroleum. And there's a lot of whales that were dancing in tutus uh, after this took place uh, because that uh, would relieve some of the pressure uh, on the hunting. Also ended up uh, making uh, some oil people very rich. Now, the Southern perspective, and this is a statement from Waddell. The Yankees fought on the calculation of profit. The North's sole purpose in prosecuting the war was not as stated to free uh, the slaves, but to dominate the South financially. 
This fact never left my mind and reconciles me to the destruction of the property which was captured. Uh, he did not have any second thoughts about doing this. He firmly believed that uh, this was uh, the true cause of the conflict. And uh, there's evidence uh, that yes, he might be right on that. In the years leading up to Lincoln's first presidency, his campaign denied that abolishing slavery was part of his platform. Uh, we even had a Yankee brigadier who proposed that the North finance its part in the war by transporting captured slaves to Cuba to be resold. Um, this particular uh, brigadier was a, um, a political um, general, appointed general, and he had a lot of other uh, attributes uh, on his resume uh, that uh, make this uh, sound like a choir boy. So this is, uh, we departed in, um, excuse me, we sailed on through the Indian Ocean and made Melbourne, Australia, which was be the only port that uh, would be able to dry dock the Shenandoah uh, for repairs. Um, the Melbourne people were, were very friendly for the most part to the Confederates. Uh, there were two newspapers who were very pro-South. There was one that was very pro-North. So there was some division there. But uh, while they were there, they were treated pretty well, depending on which company they kept. Uh, while the, uh, the uh, vessel was laid up, uh, they made some friends in, uh, in Australia. And uh, they ended up departing in February of 1865 with about 40 stowaways, stowaways. Wink, wink, nod, nod. Uh, that's what we call them. And uh, when they got out into some international war waters, they just so happened to find, oh, do we have stowaway people on board that are willing to sign up for our adventure? And so they signed them up uh, to partake in the destruction of the whale fleet. Uh, they reached Ascension Island in April and the Bering Sea in June of, uh, eight, June of 1865. And therefore, there is where they prosecuted their destruction of the whaling fleet. In the action in the Aleutians, uh, there were 58 whalers of, um, flying the uh, American colors, nearly half were sunk by the Shenandoah at a rate of uh, 10 whalers in seven hours, uh, even after learning of Lee's surrender in the fall of Richmond. Now we know that Kirby Smith surrendered in May of 26 and Joseph Johnson surrendered in April 26. The last shot uh, was fired by the Shenandoah, uh, June of 22nd of 1865. Now, at this point in time, they have found that there are some papers that uh, tell of Lee's uh, surrender and the fall of Richmond. They uh, do prosecute uh, pulling over some other vessels of various flags because ships change flags in this era. Um, they did leave the Aleutians when they felt that there's something that's a little bit strange and that they might be in, in trouble. Uh, so they left the Aleutians in uh, July of 1865 and intercepted the Barracuda August of uh, 2nd. It was on the, this vessel that they found newspapers that said, yes, indeed, uh, learned of the uh, surrenders of Johnson and Kirby Smith. Um, uh, we learned that um, um, the president has been captured. He's no longer escaped Richmond and the Union forces. He's no longer encouraging uh, guerrilla warfare. Richmond has fallen. Um, and so the status of the uh, uh, Shenandoah has changed greatly. 
Now, instead of being a privateer, uh, it is a pirate uh, because they did not realize uh, that the war was actually over when they still were sinking whalers. Now, of course, under penalty of law, if you're convicted as a pirate, uh, you could be hung. Well, they decided uh, that uh, with this insurmountable evidence that uh, it was best that uh, they put their cannon away and uh, stop prosecuting the, the war on the whaling fleet. Um, they realized that they were in danger uh, if they ever encounter a Union ship. Uh, we don't know uh, what their chances of survival are actually going to be. After some serious consideration, they decided to sail around the Cape of Good Horn and uh, try to make for Great Britain. And they felt that that would probably be the best port for them uh, to land in and receive some kind of fair treatment. Now, the North, on the other hand, um, is very angry. Um, they want reparations. Uh, there's the case of um, Charles Sumner, who insisted on reparations from Great Britain for violations of neutrality. You may be remember, you may remember him uh, from a beating he took from Preston Brooks from South Carolina uh, in the Capitol, beating him senseless or nearly senseless with a um, brass headed cane. Um, some Southerners probably believe that he was already in that state. Um, Grant finally said, okay, so sue him. And so that sounded like a pretty darn good idea. And that uh, brings us to the area of the Alabama claims. Uh, and the dispute went to international court in December 15th, 1871. Uh, first of all, you have to devise a court to have the hearings. Uh, and then you have to have the trial and come up with some kind of findings. The result was that the British were actually fined uh, $15.5 million. Uh, Sumner wanted $2 billion. Uh, the Confederates shank, sank nearly 250 ships and the insurance rates were so high that another 715 ships were sold to foreign ownership. Uh, the people in New England were getting out of the shipping business. Can't make a profit. In 1860, two thirds of New York commerce was carried by American ships. By 1863, three quarters were carried on foreign bottoms. So there's vast difference in the economies uh, in this short period of time. And in this time, British gains dominance in the world ocean going commerce for the next 80 years until World War II. So we can understand the, uh, the courts, uh, there was a three to two decision uh, that uh, the British lost this particular case, but it was perhaps a rather small price to pay uh, for the amount of commerce that they, uh, they would uh, take. The uh, Shenandoah and the uh, captain, officers, crew uh, were, uh, were outstanding sailors. Uh, and the hardships that they went through were terrible. Uh, when they first started off, uh, they started off with a crew of uh, only about uh, 40 people where they really needed 150 to sailor. Um, when they would stop ships, uh, they would uh, recruit people from those ships to join them for riches, plunder. Uh, and some of them did do that. And some of the hated Yankees, they just wouldn't have anyway, so they were put in irons. Uh, they would then be uh, offloaded into islands or other ships that were set free. 
there were over a thousand prisoners taken. Now the unusual part about this is that there was not a single casualty, not a one. This was a commerce raider. They were only after uh, goods and, uh, to destroy the economy, no loss of life. And I take that back, there was two people, but they were crew members of the Shenandoah. And this, uh, they died about 600 miles away from England. One was a um, of Hawaiian heritage who ended up dying of syphilis. And another one was a, a southerner who was wounded at uh, Shiloh with a lung injury. And um, that lung injury kept on bothering him. And with all the hardships of sailing around uh, uh, the Horn and uh, in Good Hope, um, and more activity in the uh, northern uh, Pacific, it's amazing that he lasted that long. Now, the United States Navy uh, apparently thought that uh, Mr. Waddell said, did a wonderful job because they uh, launched a guided missile cruiser or guided missile destroyer, USS Waddell, uh, in the 1960s. And um, she took active service in the Vietnam War, won many uh, service stars, uh, was eventually sold to the Greek Navy in uh, 1992. And uh, she was eventually sunk by uh, target practice and is now uh, serving as an artificial reef, I'm sure, uh, for the Mediterranean, somewhere in the Mediterranean. Do we have any questions? Dennis, I just wanna thank you for the presentation and going through all of that and, and, and use this as a moment while we have that on the screen to remind folks, uh, we're taking questions in the comments section uh, on the Facebook posts. If you're watching live, leave them. We're gonna to try to get through as many as we can uh, before we wrap up here. Um, but if you're watching or listening to a later broadcast, still send them our way and we'll keep that conversation going. Uh, Dennis, if I can, I, I wanna start with, with one question um, and ask because admittedly, this was something I didn't know about until uh, you brought it to my attention and you and George brought it to my attention with the Civil War Roundtable programming. I'm curious what initially drew you to study this ship in this moment in history as you've done here. What got you excited about this? Actually, uh, it was quite a surprise to me. Um, a little while ago, my uh, younger brother who travels around the world uh, in his job uh, found himself in Alaska and he found a book and he understood uh, my taste in literature. And so he sent this book to me, uh, it was called The Last Shot. And I thought, well, okay, that might be good for uh, you know, some trivia contest or something like that. But uh, the more I went into the book and uh, other materials, questions came up. What is a whaler, what uh, is a surface raider doing in the Northern Pacific and why, it, it, uh, does this make sense? Uh, and so I started pulling strings uh, and uh, seeing where the puzzle fit together and said, oh, now I have a, a better picture of really what's happening here. And this gives us a new viewpoint or a new slant or maybe not new, but one that's rarely talked about. Um, and that is the war of economics. Uh, between the South and the North. Uh, we understand that um, after the war, uh, the ec economy in the South was ruined. They did not uh, come back to pre-war uh, levels until after World War II, uh, but uh, no one ever said anything about what they did to the North. And uh, that uh, is really interesting, uh, as well as it served as a foundation of international law as we know it today for civil cases. And it's still in effect uh, today. A long lasting uh, effect of the Civil War. 
appreciate that, Dennis. And, and I want to pitch over to uh, George Deitch here, who's going to ask some questions too, but I'll read one of the comments from the comment section. Very informative talk. Thank you. And actually, I'll read a second one. Very good program. Thank you. So folks are enjoying that, Dennis. George, I want to get over to you because I know you've come with some questions prepared. So George, to you. Sure. Um, again, thanks, Dennis. It was a great program. So considering Britain's neutrality, official neutrality, can you explain, explain a little more about how the Confederacy managed to uh, receive the warships that they uh, uh, and, and paid for them and then transferred ownership? And particularly, um, how did they manage to get, um, uh, get out to sea and get armed and reflagged? Can you tell, explain a little bit more about that? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, and I'm going to give you a shorter answer because it can go on and on. Uh, it's a uh, subterfuge, basically. Uh, the Southern people uh, sent uh, people to England, obviously, for support. And they did have uh, a lot of people in England who sympathized with the South. Uh, but uh, Britain's stated purpose using uh, their neutrality uh, is, is plain, but it can be uh, circumvented. And you circumvent it by um, purchasing ships and the South really didn't have an awful lot of purchasing power, uh, but they were wheeling and dealing and saying promising cotton uh, where cotton was starting to get scarce in Great Britain. And uh, so that meant uh, the price of cotton went up and uh, they, were, they were dealing in a lot of promises, a lot of promissory notes uh, to actually purchase uh, some of these vessels. Uh, um, Mr. Dudley does a wonderful job from what I've been able to see. Uh, otherwise there would have been a lot more. Uh, having only four of them um, get out, uh, I think is rather phenomenal. Now, the way that it is really done was um, in the Sea King, uh, the sailors were promised uh, uh, a voyage and getting paid for a voyage to go to Bombay. Uh, all the shipping papers were saying, we're going to Bombay. Bills of lading were falsified. Uh, and then they set sail from uh, Liverpool and then London, and eventually going to Madeira. Um, where they met with another vessel called the Ariel. Now the Ariel, again, was falsifying records, but they were just loaded uh, with armaments and things for the Shenandoah to use. Uh, they had six guns. Uh, they had two 12 pounders, uh, two Whitworths, which uh, I found rather interesting because as you know, those are uh, breech loaders and I believe they're uh, rifled as, as well. It gives them a bit of a range. And then there were two that were uh, undescribed, but uh, during the loading uh, or unloading of uh, cargo onto the Sea King, uh, there were some crates of 24 pound uh, cannonballs that broke and they scattered themselves around the deck. And the um, report was that the sailors were just too tired even just to round them up. But since they were 24 pound cannonballs, I don't believe that they were using that for ballast. So that might give us a hint as to uh, what those other two uh, guns were. Um, in October 7th, she left London. October 19th, she was in Madeira Island. Um, and then they were offloading at night in a rather big hurry because if uh, there was a vessel that interrupted them, uh, they could find themselves in big trouble. Um, They're still going to be uh, carrying British ensigns. And the one thing that I found interesting with the vessels is um, in the reports of the diaries uh, that were recorded from the book, um, they were able to tell the cut of the hull in the design of the vessel and determine whether it was American built or British built uh, with relative certainty. And of course, if this is British built, uh, that's going to really help 
in the disguising their activities. Uh, they only left with about 42 hands, well short of what they needed. Uh, only five um, people from the Sea King joined out of 55 people. Uh, those were British subjects. Five were uh, taken from the Laurel, who were British. Uh, they had 10 um, from the Alabama, uh, survivors from the Alabama, and they had 23 other officers uh, from the various uh, countries. Uh, I hope that answers your question, George. Sure. Um, and they then were off to raid. Okay, so they, um, they armored up well outside the territories, subterfuge, it's a great story. Um, then I kind of go to the end of, or toward the end of the story. And um, uh, after the uh, attack on the whaling fleet, they sailed down uh, uh, the West Coast and um, eventually they met up with Barracuda. They found out that the South had surrendered uh, completely. And then they were off to find a, a friendly port, or at least a port that wasn't going to intern them. And in looking at the map, they went past Pitcairn Island, which is one of the mo most remote islands in the uh, world. They went around Cape Horn in the dead of winter, which is a horrible place to try to sail, and then um, up to England. Um, I, I, I find that part of the journey pretty fascinating if they were able to, uh, you know, circumnavigate the world and, and elude the uh, Union Navy who was certainly chasing them. Can you, uh, can you tell any more about that, um, that journey and, and some of their hardships? Uh, yes, a little bit more. Um, the, uh, it's a very long uh, journey, as you said. Uh, they're, they're finding that um, they're in peril. Uh, and when you're frightened, uh, boy, you can do some wonderful things. Uh, sailing by Pitcairn Island, obviously, yes, that, uh, they're going to try to avoid shipping channels. I suspect that they're going to put the British ensign up on their uh, uh, mast or, or aft um, and try to cloak themselves. And they're not really uh, worried too much about the British as much as they are about uh, the, the northern um, uh, the federals. Uh, like I said, there are a lot of people upset um, in New England, especially, which is obviously where Sumner's home state is. Uh, and the North had granted amnesty to everybody else in the Civil War, except for the officers of the Shenandoah at this time. So um, his instincts were very good. I'm talking about uh, Waddell. Um, the perilous journey uh, was, was terrible. Um, they found that uh, in some cases, the ropes uh, froze in the blocks and uh, that makes it very difficult to reef the sails um, because you can't raise or lower the sail. So the only other thing you can do is uh, uh, change your sail, sail attitude and try to spill some some air. Um, this takes a great amount of seamanship, uh, some great navigation. Uh, these are extremely talented people. And uh, like I said, their, their fingers are freezing. Uh, they do have um, a fair amount of, of food. Um, Water is always a, a case that uh, when you're out at sea, but I don't think they were out for um, that long a period of time where they have to water up. Water was about to, uh, every two months, two months max, uh, but the hardships were just absolutely incredible. And uh, that, it probably helped, uh, you know, cause the deaths of the two individuals that sailed on this adventure. Hey, Ben, do you want to take the uh, uh, next questions? 
Yeah, I appreciate that, George. Pitching back over to me, a, a lot of thanks and gratitude in the comment section. Uh, and, and one of the things uh, I know I was wondering this, Dennis, and uh, we've got somebody in the in the uh, audience wondering it as well. You mentioned a book earlier uh, that I think you said your brother uh, had gifted to you. What was the name of that book? Can you remind us? And then any other resources uh, that you found exciting on your journey and your research here that you would want to point people in the direction of. So what was that book you already mentioned and the, uh, anything else you want to point to? Uh, the book is uh, called The Last Shot. And it is, uh, author is Lynn Schooler. That's L-Y-N-N-S-C-H-O-O-L-E-R. Um, he has some very interesting things to say in there. And then I... Of course, I uh, like to do some fact checking and uh, uh, round out a few things. So I just go back to my old faithful uh, Battle Cry of Freedom from uh, McPherson. Uh, that's a, a standard reference book that uh, if you're looking for something, you can probably find some kind of reference in there. And it's just so well done. Uh, there is, a, I've, I Googled it and uh, you can, uh, you can, find some sites on Google, but they won't go into it as deeply as uh, I have just done tonight. And, and when you go deeply like that, Dennis, t take us behind the scenes, I guess, show us a little bit of how the sausage is made. How, how long do you spend researching a topic like this? Uh, how deep do you dive? What does your research process look like? Take us into that. Uh, that's a good question. I've been working on this for a couple of months. Uh, Seriously, um, just going through the reading and finding, anytime you find something, you want to check it out. Um, and you also want to pull a string. Where does this go? Uh, why is this happening? Um, I do not go for simplistic answers. Uh, there are people that say, what causes the Civil War? Slavery. Okay, done. Uh, no, it's a much more complex area of study than that. And uh, this is something that I learned in, uh, uh, in my docentship with uh, the Niagara, uh, is that uh, I use a lot more uh, reference materials uh, because they're just so plentiful. Uh, and then all of a sudden, uh, a picture starts to evolve. Um, as soon as there's a gap in the picture, I want to find where that puzzle piece goes. And so I'll keep on searching until I find that, that piece. It might be under the throw rug. Uh, so I'll go through all the throw rugs and try to find it until I get that piece put in there. And, and Dennis, I, I think you put together a, a, a full puzzle here for us tonight. And, and, and there's a lot more that we can talk about. Um, but, but as we're narrowing in on our time and, and we're looking at the puzzle pieces and we see the pieces and we see the entire puzzle, uh, if a listener or a viewer is to take away one particular element of that entire puzzle looking at it, or if they're to take a few pieces away that you hope that they're still thinking about, um, you know, a few days from now when they're reflecting on this topic, what do you hope that they, they take away from, from this presentation, Dennis? I would say the importance of uh, the economics uh, in the strategy that was played. Um, you could liken it maybe to a chess game um, where the king is in check, the king is in check, the king is in check, uh, and um, you're in trouble. So what you do is instead of going a defensive posture, charge, and you uh, attack the, your opponent's king. And that's exactly what they did here. Um, the end result, uh, I think, is absolutely fantastic with the uh, foundation the one good thing that came out of the Civil War, there's probably others, but one really good one was the advancement of, uh, of international law. And that, that serves as a foundation for maybe how we all get along together in the international field. Mr. Dennis Carlson, I, I thank you for taking the time, the energy, the effort on all of this research, uh, showing us some of the behind the scenes, walking us through that. I, I really appreciate that. 
Uh, again, just gratitude I'm seeing in the comments section. Uh, we appreciate the viewers too for tuning in. Thank you viewers for, for tuning in and watching along. Uh, George, I, I wanted to make sure I pitched one more time back to you if you had any other questions uh, right now as we wrap up today's program. No, I think we're getting um, uh, uh, pretty close to our timeline. Um, again, Dennis, uh, really appreciate uh, all that you, all the research and everything that you did. Uh, the Civil War Roundtable goes on a hiatus every year at this time. Um, we'll be back in September. Not quite sure if we're going to be in person at the Hagen History Center as we have been for a number of years, or if we're going to be online, or perhaps both. So. Um, uh, if you find out about us through any of our social media, um, know that we'll be back to see you in September. There's a song about that, isn't there? <laughs> yes, I think so. There's something to that effect. And what I hear is stay tuned. And uh, George, while you've got the mic, uh, where can folks find more information about the Hagen History Center for to point them somewhere? Sure. Um, if you uh, have any questions um, that you uh, want to uh, shoot to me for Dennis, um, it's eriehistory.org, eriehistory.org. Um, you can find my email on that. Please uh, send us any questions. Uh, we have uh, great things coming up. Um, COVID depending, we'll be opening or uh, reopening the Historical Society Hagen History Center uh, buildings. Uh, we're, we've gone from one pre-COVID. We will now have four exhibit buildings open. We poured a huge amount of time, effort, and money. Um, many new galleries who are essentially gonna be um, America's newest museum will be opening the weekend of the 16th, 17th, and 18th of July. So uh, watch for that. There'll be plenty of publicity coming up and we'd love to see you folks come down. That's right, folks. Stay tuned. EerieHistory.org. Head there. And of course, for more information about uh, both upcoming uh, JES programs, as well as past discussions that you can stream on demand, uh, head over to our website, JESerie.org. Uh, you're also going to find a wide range of publications from timely reads on current topics to reports, essays, and more. Uh, and of course, be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, and one more time, Dennis Carlson, I want to thank you. And I want to read one more comment uh, from the comment section. What a truly wonderful presentation, well-researched, well-presented, with a sense of humor. Congratulations. Uh, so Dennis, we thank you for that. Uh, and we, we tell folks to stay tuned uh, to find out about Civil War Roundtable programming, the future of it, taking a little hiatus, but we'll be back, no doubt, one way or the other. So on behalf of the Erie Civil War Roundtable and the Hagen History Center and for the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us. Thank you, gentlemen.